Most of us who've played D&D can remember that first character that we ever rolled up. For me, I was 12 years old. A friend of mine had invited me over to his house to watch them play. I watched for a while. They said, would you like to roll up a character? I'm like, sure. Uh, in those days, we rolled three dice. You took what you got. Uh, it was always strength, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, charisma, always in that order, I think from the original books. So the first roll in front of this group I made was an 18. I rolled a natural 18 on my first roll. Never did it again in terms of three dice. Uh, the other characteristics were okay, but I was an 18 strength dwarven fighter. I named him Nabisco. Yes, I was 12 years old. Those were the sort of names we had. And he went through this world and survived this battle and that and epic adventures. And I got up to seventh level and then Nabisco died. And not only did he die, but he was killed, I think, by a desert version of a purple worm, a giant worm, and the worm ate him. He was not going to be resurrected. He was dead. So I rolled up a new character. Uh, in fact, it was another fighter. This time I named him Hydrox. Again, I was 12 years old. But you know, part of me never got over losing Nabisco, the Dwarven fighter. After he died, when I went to school or sat around home, I thought about this character that I had rolled up, that I had played for hours and hours. He was a part of me in a way. And the other problems that I had at school, at home, obviously it, it was a game and I realized that. But also, my character was dead. And we've all seen this in terms of there are people who their character gets killed and they leave the game, they never want to play again. And anyone who loves D&D &D and has played the game, they know exactly what that feeling is. Because part of the reason D&D is the greatest game ever invented is that you realize something stronger even than films or books or any fictional situation. You realize that characters are real. Hello again, my name is K.R. King and this is my YouTube channel on creating a homebrewed campaign. Today I'm going to talk about characters, characters being real, how to make your characters real uh, in terms of your NPCs, in terms of your monsters and the humanoids, and this in turn will have your players uh, be in, come invested in your campaign. Uh, as I mentioned in, in terms of we all know this from our own characters, our NPCs in D&D because we, we, we identify with them, we work through them, they, and especially if you're running in a campaign in which the world seems real, uh, the characters and monsters that you run into seem, seem real as well. So there's a concept here to think about which is the old fictional paradox. That is, how is it that human beings, even though they know a story uh, is false, whether it's a novel or a film. They know the characters in the story are either not real or as in a film uh, portrayed by actors, and yet they become emotionally invested in these characters' lives, stories. They become invested in the actions that they see or read about. There's a paradox here. They know it's not real, and yet they react as though it is real. And this is a powerful part of storytelling. This is why storytelling is so important. This is what D&D as a game and, and other uh, fictional pursuits uh, key in on in terms of our enjoyment. So I'm going to use just as one example the television show Breaking Bad in which you have this mild-mannered high school teacher Walter White who becomes a drug dealer and goes through all these escapades as he rises up through the drug ranks and we see uh, tremendous cliffhanger action. Uh, he's almost caught multiple times. He uses all sorts of ingenuity and, and luck to escape and we as we travel through Walter White's story of becoming this drug dealer. We worry about him. We worry about his family. Uh, we want him to escape and yet we know that he should be captured at some level and we are totally invested in his story. And yet all the while as a viewer we know that Walter White is a fictional character being portrayed by an actor, Brian Cranston. And in fact in today's media environment we can see outtakes of Breaking Bad. We can see the actors talking about the various scenes, what they went through, how they came up with different characterizations, or how the writers came up with storylines. We can see this over and over. And yet, when we're watching the show, when we are immersed in an episode of Breaking Bad or any television program film in the middle of a book, we have this reaction, this emotional connection. We're worried about the characters. All of our physiological reactions are 
the same as a real life situation. This is that fictional paradox. Walter White is a great character. He's drawn in such a way that we get him, we believe him. Even if a lot of the actions within Breaking Bad break our uh, suspension of disbelief, there's coincidences, uh, there's situations that arise that you know might not hold up to true scrutiny. We believe because we believe in Walter White. He is a character that we are invested in. And this is what we're going to do when we create characters for our Dungeons & Dragons campaign. So when you're creating characters, whether NPCs or sentient monsters in your world, you want to think about a few basic characteristics that all characters have. Uh, and you don't always have to do all of these, especially for characters that are sort of peripheral or if you're doing an improvisational sort of creation. But if these are the main characters uh, in your campaign, in your starting point, the people that your player characters are going to be interacting with, it's really important. The more in-depth you can go to create these characters for their background, the better they'll be when they're interacting. So let's think about what is the most basic factor of a character, whether they are male, female, or some uh, thing in between, or whether there are no male females. But that is the sort of basic identity of a character. The next level is going to be their family. Who are the parents of this character? So all characters that you come from some place, they have a mother and father at some level. Uh, they also may have siblings, uh, especially again the humanoid races, but even monsters depending on the social structure of these creatures. What are their relationships with their parents? Who were they? And sometimes the siblings and the parents can be very important, especially if you get into an, an aristocratic culture or character. Uh, if you're the firstborn son of a king, you have a different place in the family than the thirdborn son or firstborn daughter, depending on how the kingdom is situated. If you want to make it so that uh, any firstborn child of the king will then be the ruler, that's fine. But it's important to think about what that means in terms of growing up, knowing, for example, that you are going to take over the realm, you are going to take over your father's trading concern, uh, or you are going to be relegated far down the list to make your own way. And how does this affect your relationship to your parents, to your siblings? Um, the next thing we have with a character, obviously the characteristics. And we roll these up, as I mentioned, my 18 strength dwarven fighter was known for his strength. He had tremendous strength, and this affected in terms of his abilities as a fighter. That's why he chose the fighting profession, uh, because obviously when he grew up, it was clear that he had great strength. And all these things, you know, the intelligence, uh, the charisma, the dexterity, these all affect a character as they are coming up in the world. Uh, their relations, again, with their family, with their friends, uh, with the social strata in which they grew up, in which they interact at, before they become uh, adults. So the characteristics we think of, we tend to think of characteristics in terms of gameplay, in terms of you know battles or spell casting, uh, uh, making saving throws, this sort of thing. But these are also important in terms of forming the character, forming the person that is going to be interacting uh, with your player characters, uh, who is going to be uh, leading uh, groups of non-players, groups of monsters. Uh, who is going to be also uh, potentially allying with your player characters or opposing them, these characteristics. These characteristics, which I guess you could say are the innate characteristics, right? They then affect how this character sees the world uh, and how they react to situations. Now, obviously with a character you also have situations, their view of the world, which again can be based on their family background. We often take on the views of our parents. I'm old now, so I hear myself saying things that my father said that I sometimes said I would never say. Uh, so we have that influence on us. We also have the influence in terms of our attitudes of where we grow up, uh, the time period, uh, the, the geographic area, uh, the social system, the political system. All these affect our attitudes about, about religion, about government, about the way people should behave. We also have interests that are dictated by our educational level. How much education did this character receive, both as a child, are they interested in this as an adult? And again, this fixture, you may have a highly intelligent character that never had any education, and vice versa. So the characteristics themselves don't necessarily determine the interest of a character in such things. And you may have a character who uses these characteristics, charisma is the classic example, for both good or ill.
right? Their ability to convince people if a person is good or bad, uh, their usage of these characteristics is important. I'm going to talk more about alignments a little bit later, but suffice to say in terms of gameplay, a character's alignment is very important. A lawful good character is going to react to situations differently than a chaotic evil character and vice versa. Uh, we'll get into that as I said. Uh, the alignments are perhaps not as important in the 5e rules as they used to be, although again you can use them sort of as a guidepost for things. Uh, your player characters are going to tend to behave in a good lawful good uh, scenario it's difficult to run with evil characters uh, you know i'll talk about that a little but in terms especially monsters they, they show their alignments in there uh, along with their base characteristics but within those alignments there can be variations there can be uh, creatures that sort of go against the grain and the, again these are often the most interesting sort of npcs or, or sort of monsters uh, so the, the constraints of alignment aren't necessarily as rigid as you might think. No character grows up in isolation. I've talked about the family unit, the parents, the siblings, and you can expand that if you want into cousins and grandparents. Again, uh, it's not really necessary unless you have some sort of aristocratic or some kind of rigid social hierarchy that needs to be uh, explained. But then the character, the, the, the settlement or town or city that they grew up in, when you have a community, especially the sort of small medieval communities uh, that we often see in D&D, and I'm going to be running this frontier campaign, so these are towns and cities, but small. The largest city, Elsinax, I'm going to have 15,000 people. The city that I'm going to start, Dramos, I'm thinking 6,000 people. So any character, any NPC that grows up in Dramos knows a lot of people in town. Not necessarily every single person, but a lot of them. So during their educational period, during apprenticeship, if they are a merchant, uh, the people that they fought with, if they're in the army, uh, the people in the temple, if they're in a clerical thing, and so on and so forth. They have connections with these people. And again, how do they get along? Are they a person who's charismatic, a natural leader? Are they a loner? Uh, do they not get along? And you can you can have characters whose you know family structure is totally supportive and totally good, and yet they're just ill-tempered. They just don't get along with people. And that can be something that's interesting. They may resent the fact that they don't get along with people. Now, oftentimes, our worst characteristics we dislike, right? We often dislike other people who have our worst characteristics. It's a common psychological trope, but it's real. So a very good mirror into a character's both uh, flaws and good aspects of their personality are in their relations with those around them, the relations with those closest to them, but then just generally in terms of their profession, in terms of their daily life. How do they get along? You must also have consistency in a character. In terms of both good characteristics and bad, most of us are consistent in terms of we do the same things over and over. When a character, an NPC, for example, is interacting with your player characters, you want consistency in how they behave, how they react with these characters. This consistency uh, re lends verisimilitude to the characters that you're creating. We know who they are and how they react. If you know a character can't be trusted, they can't be trusted. If you know they can, they can. Now, there is some subtlety to this. If you're dealing with a ruler of a city, for example, even if he's lawful good, he's looking out for the city. He has to make decisions for the city that may not go with your interests of individuals. And it's very important to remember that the responsibilities of a person, whether it's a leader, uh, whether it's someone who has a commercial concern, uh, whether it's a person in a family. Blood is thicker than water. A person is going to react differently in terms of a member of their family than versus a stranger or acquaintance. Uh, and they may, in fact, go against their interests or against what we think of as their alignment. And this will make them consistent. This will make them seem real. So you want to know what their relations are with not just their family, but the world around them. Who are their friends versus associates? Who are their enemies? Enemies are going to be very important, especially we're going to have NPCs that are interacting with your player characters that may be their enemies, right? That they're, they're uh, nemesis, as they say in the rules when they outline this. And this is really important in terms of how did we get there? A character didn't just wake up one day and decide, I hate that person. Something occurred between them. Whether it was a feud between two families that occurred far in the past, oftentimes the exact cause is forgotten, or whether it's something in the background when they were kids or growing up, uh, some incident that occurred uh, as adults uh, that put them against them, or some incident occurred that made them lifelong friends, that created bonds of loyalty. 
And, and these are important to have this kind of history. Your player characters who have grown up in the community, the starting point, are also going to have relations. They're going to know people in town. They're going to know where I need to get a tailor, where I need to get a blacksmith. You know, who are the merchants? They're going to know this whether they grew up as urchins or they grew up as the daughter of the richest person in town. They're going to have these relationships. They're going to have some knowledge of who is to be trusted and not, who is their friend, who is their foe. So this web of interconnections that's so important in the starting point of your player character's cities also is reflected in the fact that when they go to places they're not familiar, they don't have these connections. They don't necessarily know who to trust and who not. This is where introductions to people are important. If you haven't been introduced to someone by uh, someone that you can trust, you're wary. You're not sure who this person really is. So these relationships are very important and they should be fairly well defined for your player characters and we'll talk about when the characters come in and roll up their group and roll up their player characters you need to have a sense of who they would know uh, what relationships they would have depending on their character class uh, and also the their social class that that they have decided because these are what make us up as human beings it isn't just the raw characteristics that determine our actions within the rules of the game but it is our relationships with others in growing up coming up in the world to the point when the game starts, that, that moment when we all go into the game and begin playing, we have a history that started from when we were born to the moment that the game starts. And it's important to have a sense of that history, not just your player characters, but all of the NPCs and the sentient monsters that, that they run into. When you have an encounter you've created, say with a, a group of trolls out in the wilderness, those trolls are characters. Those trolls have some kind of family relationships, right? They have mothers, fathers, they have children. We know that trolls uh, have a certain attitude towards humans. Uh, they're going to be probably attacking. They're going to try to kill them, etc. So you may not have to go into as much detail as your NPCs that live in your starting point settlement. But still, there is a richness there in terms of the way they live, the way they've carved out their world. And I'm going to talk more about villains and talk more about uh, giving them dimensionality, uh, making them more interesting, while acknowledging that they are villains. They're probably going to be opposed to your player characters. They're probably going to come into conflict. That's going to end in death, one way or the other. But we're always going to be aware that not merely NPCs, that monsters, any sentient monsters do at some level have motivations and desires that when they wake up every day, they're getting up and they're doing things to satiate those desires. To, that's what motivates their activities. So that when your NPCs come in, we have a consistency there within those desires and motivations. And there is perhaps a chance for some cooperation or at least uh, some different kind of activity than merely having battles, than merely having hack and slash with the monsters. So let's create a character. This is going to be the character that our player characters first meet when they decide to get together and begin adventuring in your world.